Well, I've just received the word that we're right to go. So welcome everyone to this final session of the Livestock Forum titled Building Resilient Livestock Systems. This, this session is sponsored by Nutrient Ag Solutions and we thank Nutrient very much for their support once again for this forum. This afternoon, we're going to have several speakers. Each speaker will talk for about 15 minutes um, with one exception. Now, because of our time constraints, can I please ask, uh, we may have time for questions at the end of each speaker, but it's more likely that questions will have to go through the chat. So if people type questions in during the chat, in the chat during the talk, and hopefully the speaker will have time later on if necessary to go back and answer them. But without delaying any further, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Jennifer Manyweathers, who is a veterinary lecturer in Ruminant Health and Epidemiology at Charleston University, who is going to give us a talk on farm-led partnerships and their approach to biosecurity. Thank you, Jennifer. Great, thank you, John. Can everyone hear me okay? <laughs> Not that I'd know if you couldn't, perhaps. Um, anyway, I wanted to uh, thank the sponsors of this session for this uh, great opportunity, um, and also the Graham Centre and all the work that's gone on in the background to make it possible for us to come together today in these uh, challenging times. Um, yes, I, I, am, I, I know my fellow speakers do as well. We really appreciate all the work that's gone in uh, to help this run so smoothly. Um, so I'd like to speak with you today about this project, um, which is now uh, in the wrap up stages, um, but it's been a very exciting um, project to be part of. And it's about thinking about uh, strengthening um, biosecurity and surveillance um, on farm, within regions, within states and territories, and also nationally as well, using a very specific uh, type of framework to do that. So this uh, obviously pr projects don't happen without a great deal of support, and I'd like to um, acknowledge our um, all the support that we've had for this project. You can see it's a very diverse group there, mixtures of uh, government support, a uh, great deal of industry and producer support, as well as the research institutions. Uh, so the project, the title, uh, the short working title was called FMD Ready, so that's short for Foot and Mouth Disease Ready. Um, and this was a rural research and development for profit project. And um, the words you see there on your, on your screen now were kind of the, um, I guess, the catch cry for the project. So we wanted to see improved surveillance, we wanted to be better prepared, and we wanted to see an earlier return to trade uh, in the event of an emergency animal disease outbreak. Now, we used uh, foot and mouth disease as a model in this project, basically because uh, we know a fair bit about it and we also know that in certainly in Australia's context um, there are massive ramifications for us uh, if we, we do have um, an outbreak of foot and mouth disease so we want to be able to um, yeah, get onto it um, as quickly as we can. So um, it's not usual that I would introduce a talk with an epidemiological curve here but I imagine that in these uh, strange times that we're in. There's not many people who haven't actually seen one of these and understand um, what it is that we're looking at there. So the, the curve that I've uh, shown you there on the screen is um, the two most recent or the two most uh, significant recent um, outbreaks of foot and mouth disease in the UK. So the dark green is 1967, 1968, and then the paler green is the more recent 2001 um, outbreak. So you can see that classic, classic, uh, classic curve where cases, uh, the first case and then a, a peak and then a gradual tail off. And um, I guess it's the tail off that, I mean, it's the outbreak itself that obviously is of concern, but this long tail at the end of outbreaks where um, people are still suffering, animals are still suffering, uh, communities are suffering and economies are suffering. So uh, part of the goal of our project was to try and shorten that tail. So um, to try and get on top of that quickly and so that would facilitate a more rapid return to trade and the new normal, whatever comes after a, a, a disease outbreak like this. So if, uh, if we can pick up the first uh, case of foot and mouth disease earlier, and even if it's by just even a few hours, half a day, um, that actually has a significant impact on how the rest of the outbreak plays out. 
Uh, so you can think of it like uh, contact tracing at the moment. So the sooner we pick up that there is a positive case of COVID, COVID um, and we can start to track who else we need to be monitoring, then we can get on top of um, outbreaks a lot more quickly than if there's delay in diagnosis or, or picking up um, that case. So that's basically what the FMD Ready project was all about, trying to shorten that long tail and actually trying to shift that whole um, epidemiological curve over to the left. So we want to pick up that first case earlier and then we want to stop that long tail from occurring. How we uh, wanted to do that, there were four sub-projects under the main project. Um, and you can see there that included making sure that we've got the right vaccine for the job. So we don't, we aren't able to store any uh, vaccine in Australia for obvious reasons. We don't have the disease, we can't store the vaccine, but we want to make sure that whatever strain of foot and mouth disease is more likely uh, to be, to, to come to us if it does come, that we've got, um, we've got, we're ready with the vaccines in the vaccine bank. So there was a large part of a project about that. The other two um, projects that I'm not going to be speaking about today were about um, using software to test um, and to be able to cost responses uh, to, to a potential outbreak. So looking at what happens if we uh, ring vaccinate um, with culling or without culling and, uh, and all those other scenarios that come into play when we think about foot and mouth disease and just have a look at, in terms of modelling, uh, the impact of that has on the cost of the outbreak and the speed with which we can um, finish the outbreak. And also using uh, big data to map virus spread. So what, what might we expect depending on where the virus uh, is picked up? That's using meteorological dis, uh, data and all sorts of other uh, big data that we have available to us. Uh, but what I'd like to speak with you about today is um, this uh, second sub-project, so the Pharma-Led Partnership uh, for Improved Surveillance. Um, and again, that comes down to picking up that first case uh, earlier. So I'd like to introduce uh, this sub-project to you today. Um, so the aim of this specific sub-project was again, picking up that first case so that we have less impactful and more readily controlled outbreaks. And we wanted to, to think about the idea of um, improving partnerships. So improving uh, communication and trust among partnerships and whether that uh, can then contribute to improved on-farm surveillance picking up those diseases earlier. Obviously, we're thinking in the project about foot and mouth disease, but this has um, obvious ramifications for uh, other emergency diseases as well as endemic diseases. So um, I'll just quickly run through what the overall project looked like, and then I actually want to speak to you about one specific part of this sub-project. So we started off by um, obviously wanting to understand what the current surveillance system looks like. And that involved a whole series of uh, interviews and um, looking at the data that was around about what, what the surveillance system looks like in theory versus what it looks like in practice and where are the gaps, where are the successes, where are the failures. So that was the first part of, uh, of that uh, project so that we could really um, understand um, the basis of of, of the surveillance system and, and current um, biosecurity in Australia. The second part was thinking about um, risk. So when we think about the risk of a foot and mouth disease outbreak, what do we actually mean by that? And at all the different uh, levels and components and different stakeholders, what does risk look like? So we used um, uh, uh, the concept of vulnerability, which is um, we defined as the likelihood of exposure to foot and mouth disease and the capacity to respond. So we looked at those two components uh, in our vulnerability, vulnerability framework. And um, we did some Bayesian network analysis on that. And so there's some work coming out of that um, at the moment. I'm very happy to be contacted at another stage to talk about that uh, if you're interested in hearing more about that. And just for interest sake, this is what a Bayesian network <laughs> looks like on screen. It's an interactive model. This is obviously just a static picture, but um, that, that's proven to be a very exciting way of thinking about disease um, risk and preparedness and also using that vulnerability frame um, to help us understand what that risk actually looks like on the ground. But what I'd like to speak with you today uh, is 
um, the pilots, uh, the pilot that we ran to test this idea about um, improving and strengthening partnerships of stakeholders in the animal health and disease surveillance system. So traditionally, um, we have this approach of um, research based um, suggestions coming forward, extended by an extension officer and given to producers to implement. Um, and that's brought forward some very great innovation, but we wanted to tweak it and see whether it, rather than have researchers uh, deciding what might work and what they wanted to think about, but actually letting all the stakeholders together in one room think about uh, what they wanted the surveillance system to look like, identifying weaknesses and gaps, and also um, devising solutions or potential solutions that they thought they might try. So you can see here um, this network, um, and this is just based on our uh, project. The model is called um, Agricultural Innovation Systems, uh, and it has been used around the world um, in developing countries and also uh, places like New Zealand uh, to try and bring all the stakeholders to the table with equal voices to talk about surveillance and biosecurity and how we might do it better. Um, you can you could uh, imagine that this is uh, um, challenging because we uh, we have multiple stakeholders. They all have uh, different priorities and different resources available to them, um, and it's um, I guess it's a very messy <laughs> process. It's not everyone's cup of tea, but um, we wanted to try it and see whether this was a good model that might work uh, in, in Australian livestock industries, particularly thinking about foot and mouth disease preparedness. So this is uh, the pilot groups that we developed. Um, so we had, we were looking at the industries that would primarily be affected by foot and mouth disease. So uh, I, I ran a sheep group in Esperance. We had a goat group in uh, South Australia. Um, a uh, beef group in Jurong, a dairy group in Mafra in Victoria, and then pigs uh, in Tasmania, smallholder pigs uh, in Tasmania. So the choices of location and um, industries, obviously the, the overall industries were decided by the scope of the project, but um, we worked together with um, jurisdictions and industry groups and also producers as well about where they thought these pilot groups would be good to run. And so they're, they're a very diverse group of, uh, of pilots. Um, so for example, the sheep group, uh, I worked with the A sheep group, they're a very strong producer group already established in Esperance, um, already doing really great work in surveillance and biosecurity. And so we thought that, well, it was decided that that was a good place to go uh, to see how things were done already in an established group. Uh, the goat group, on the other hand, um, was brought together from scratch. And so there was no pre-existing network that exist, existed uh, in the surveillance space to talk about these issues. And that's a very diverse group. So um, mini goat breeders, fleece, dairy, meat. Um, yes, the whole, the whole gamut was included in that pilot group. Um, and I'll talk more about our results and our successes down the track. So um, what did we do at the meetings? Uh, it, was, uh, it was quite challenging because uh, certainly as a researcher, we, I, I like to go in with a plan, uh, but the whole idea of agricultural innovation systems is that we don't go in with answers, we go in with questions. Um, and so each pilot group started with um, an information session and this kind of question to see, to gauge who, who would be interested in, in being part of our pilot group. So obviously this one is with my sheep group, but you can just take out sheep and put in beef and change the region. This very similar question was asked across the board. And so it, it was, uh, the meetings were um, brainstorming sessions. Um, and then as they went on, so this was a four year project, we had meetings for about two years. Um, as we went on, we would continue to brainstorm to make sure that we were thinking very widely, but also um, we would all then come back and think about how we were addressing those issues that we previously identified as well. So this is just gives you a rough idea of um, how the meetings played out. Um, you can see there the locations. So again, the South Australian uh, goat group, that was uh, not pinned down to one location. So because of the diversity of the group, then they kind of put an, a pin in a map to say, 
we're going to ask everyone to travel, say, two hours, so we'll go here, and then they'd moved it somewhere else the next time. So there was no location um, sort of pinned down for that group. But you can see that um, we had quite good, strong groups, um, uh, lots of producers involved, as well as, uh, as other um, stakeholders there as well. So as well as uh, having these standalone meetings, we also wanted to think about um, the bigger picture. So obviously having something in a region, in a, a region uh, is very powerful, but the surveillance system is bigger than just one farm or one region. So we wanted to bring it into our state, territory, and then national um, way of thinking as well. So what we did, uh, we brought, um, so the meetings, the local meetings carry on over the two years and at the end of our the project we just squeaked it in actually February last year it feels very lucky it was our, our last uh, opportunity to travel so we brought um, all the pilot groups together to to, um, to Canberra and that was a very powerful meeting because the groups all of a sudden realized that they they were bigger than just their region and we had um, three chief ETMI officers who attended that meeting from different uh, states and territories which was also very powerful as well as uh, lots of other stakeholders as well. Uh, we've also been uh, interacting with the uh, Animal Health uh, Committee which is the group in charge of policy development around animal health and surveillance and trying to bring them along uh, with the discussion um, as well. So I'd like to uh, just quickly uh, present now that some of the findings. So we, it's obviously no point having a pilot if you don't test and see whether it worked. Um, so we um, had a few different ways of uh, evaluating the pilot group and I apologise for the wordiness of the next few slides. Um, but we we looked at the physical outcomes. So the what did we what did the pilot groups produce? So that was uh, that could be things like. Um, articles that were written, um, a disease guide in goats was produced with coloured photos for goat producers. Um, those kind of physical um, uh, products were all collated. We would also did a baseline survey when we started the, the pilot groups, just trying to understand what people's current practices were around biosecurity, what they thought about it. Um, and um, then we did an endline survey, and that's uh, not at all quantitative, but very qualitative data was collected about that. I've just had the one minute warning, so I'm gonna skip through these. But um, basically, uh, the thing I guess I wanted to show you was the qualitative uh, comments, I guess, that came back. So uh, we saw um, uh, lots of new surveillance practices happening. So uh, disease investigations that resulted from people's being, you know, interacting with the pilot group. We saw, we did see stronger networks being developed. So being able to put a face to a name of someone that you would need to contact in an emergency made a massive difference for, um, for, for our producers in these groups. Um, the other thing that was picked up was it, the power of learning from different perspectives. So actually sitting down and going, oh, I thought that because you're a government and vet, you thought this way, but clearly I can now see that your priorities are different for this reason. So that was very powerful, a very powerful change that we saw. And also um, just the value that science and science communication plays in how we approach um, talking about surveillance. So actually understanding what people need uh, rather than going with the least cost or the thing that we've always done, uh, that was another very powerful um, a powerful uh, finding from this. So very quickly, this is the last slide that I've got. Um, this is my very quick summary. So uh, people like to have their voices heard and that doesn't matter where they fit onto the stakeholder map. People like to have their voices heard and it doesn't matter if they don't get what they want. If their voices are heard, then that's, that's uh, transformative for um, moving forward. Innovation and relationships just take time. That's no surprise to anybody. So we need more resources um, on the ground for this to happen. Um, biosecurity and disease surveillance. So we have a, sh you know, obviously there's a shared responsibility, but if we unpack that more, that's about partnership and participating. Uh, and so that needs to be uh, thought of more deeply uh, and in a practical sense. As I said, not everyone likes this way of, of doing business. Um, and so we have some really helpful feedback about people who did struggle with the open-endedness of, um, of this project. And this deficit model of science communication, which says, uh, I as the researcher have the information and you as my audience or my listener 
bring nothing to the table and I will fill you with my the wealth of my knowledge. So that's not a great way to think about science and communication because obviously we all are experts in different things and all bring different knowledge and experience. And so we need to get rid of the deficit model and replace it with this participatory model uh, around disease surveillance. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. Um, if you've got questions, I do have to uh, leave early, unfortunately, and apologies to, the, um, to everyone in the room and also to my fellow presenters. But I'm very happy to be contacted um, at Charleston Uni um, if you've got any questions about the project. And thank you. Thanks, Jennifer, very much. Um, 15 minutes is a pretty tough gig, I know that. So we'll keep moving along quickly. Our next speaker is Dr. Sophie Hemsley, who is the Biosecurity Extension Manager for Animal Health Australia, as well as being a practicing vet and managing a sheep flock. So I'll leave it to you, Sophie. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks, everyone, for having me along. Um, my presentation is very short, sharp. It's just on practical biosecurity on farm. I thought I'd start with a little bit of an introduction into Animal Health Australia and how we can help producers on farm. So AHA is an independent national animal health body. Um, our role is to identify threats and opportunities and advocate and drive solutions for the Australian livestock industries. AHA essentially is a conduit between government and industry. We have 34 member organisations across government, peak industry bodies, service providers and associate members. So how does AHA actually help producers on farm? So the first one is the um, joint um, flagship program between Animal Health Australia and Plant Health Australia, which is the farm biosecurity website. Um, the website is basically a one-stop shop for downloadable record keeping templates and frequently asked biosecurity questions. All the templates on the website are free and also meet LPA standards. The second is the National Sheep Industry Biosecurity Strategy, which was co-developed between um, Wool Producers Australia and Sheep Producers Australia. Um, basically, the, essentially the strategy was designed to better position um, the Australian livestock industries, uh, sheep industries, sorry, uh, to take a consistent approach to biosecurity risk management. Um, AHA manages the strategy now. We have two biosecurity extension managers, so myself in New South Wales and Emily Buttle in South Australia. Um, and our role is to develop programs that are aimed at improving um, capacity throughout this, the sheep um, supply chain. So let's use um, AHA's resources in a practical way. So you're a producer, your LPA, your property's LPA accredited, and you've got a, sent a letter in the mail saying you're going to have an LPA audit. Um, up until now, you normally have keep records on your phone, maybe in your diary, on a piece of paper that's filed away in a filing cabinet somewhere, and you think it's about high time to download some templates um, so that you can actually re record and actually be compliant with LPA um, requirements. So um, this is an excerpt on the left is the LPA audit checklist. It's actually an excerpt out of the checklist. It's element six biosecurity. And on the right is the back page of the farm biosecurity website. So let's step through what we actually have, where you can find some of these templates. So the first thing you'll actually need to prove for biosecurity for the LPA audit is that you've got an on-farm biosecurity plan and you know the contact details of your local vet. So you can actually download a template, the biosecurity template from the toolkit um, tab. The second thing you'll need are national animal health declarations. Likewise, you can download them from the Livestock tab. The sheep, cattle, goats, this provides information because it's a um, repository of information for both animals and cropping. It's got both livestock and obviously cropping information on there as well for mixed farms. The third thing that you'll actually need is inspection records. So when you're bringing stock onto farm, but also um, ma managing your stock on day-to-day -day operations that you've got um, records of your inspection. So livestock records can be found in the toolkit section. Likewise, visitor records and a visitor assessment as well. The second um, way that Animal Health Australia has started to roll out some extensions through the INSEPS project is the sheep health conditions carcass impact. Um, the This tool is actually jointly developed between um, AHA and PERSI in South Australia and it's basically set so that producers, it's an interactive um, website which I'll put the um, link to in our um, 
question and answer box very shortly after the presentation. Basically, it allows producers to see what um, different conditions would lo look like in the um, processing plant. So there, there's five or six conditions there that are actually being um, developed. So arthritis, sheep measles, rib fractures, grass seeds, pleurisy and um, vaccination um, lesions. So they're the conditions, most commonly con most common conditions that are found across the National Sheep Health Monitoring Project, which basically records sheep um, conditions. It allows you to toggle at the bottom. It allows you to, to toggle between the disease and what trim you might actually expect in the, in the processor, um, by the processor. It also has fact sheets about how you, if you're getting kill sheets, um, it actually gives you information about how um, you can reduce these conditions on farm, practical ways to reduce conditions on farm. Um, and that's really me. But if you have any biosecurity extension questions or biosecurity on farm questions, either give myself or um, a call from South Australia. I'd like to acknowledge Wool Producers Australia and Sheep Producers for the ongoing support for the INSIBS project. Thank you very much, Sophie. That was nice, clear and concise and no doubt there's a lot of resources there people can access themselves if, as they want. We'll move straight on to um, Dr. Russell Barrow, who is Technical Coordinator or Research Coordinator for the Dung Beagle Ecosystems Project based here in Wagga. So, Russ, I'll leave it to you. Thank you very much. Take this opportunity to thank the organisers. It's gone very well so far and very much enjoyed myself. 15 minutes is a hard gig to stick to and we gave a workshop uh, yesterday out at Colcan and it went for over two hours. So I'll try not to delay the presentation any longer and, and go straight into it. So let me paint a picture for you. I'm gonna show you two slides. One is the cattle numbers broken down by natural resource management areas and the next one will be the sheep numbers. We're based here at Wagga. Our program is Southern Australia, essentially from the Queensland border down to Tasmania and from Byron Bay in the east across to Exmouth in the west. But let's just focus on these two areas that I've highlighted here. So we've got the Riverina NRM and we've got the Murray NRM. It's number 16 for cattle based on cattle numbers and number 20 for um, the Murray region. That's 545,000 more or less cattle in the Riverina region. Each of those beasts is producing around about 30 to 40 kilograms of dung per day. If we were multiplying that up, take an average number in there, you're going to be producing about 20 million kilograms of dung in the Riverina from the cattle alone each day. So that's 20,000 tonnes. Let's have a look at the comparable sheep numbers. The Riverina is number one for sheer numbers in Australia. There's over 5 million sheep and the Murray just below it in yellow there, it has around two and a half million. Now your sheep produce less dung. What we're talking about here is around about one to two kilograms of dung per sheep per day. But nevertheless, you multiply that by five million and you're up around the nine million kilograms per day or the 9,000 tonnes of sheep dung deposited per day. So what we're looking at in just the Riverina alone is around about 29,000 tonnes of manure, of combined cattle and sheep dung hitting the pastures each and every day. That has got potential problems and thus enter dung beetle ecosystem engineers, or more to the point, the dung beetles, because of the valuable ecosystem services that these little beasts provide. So I'll just go through the, the four that I've listed here. There's, there's others, but these are the four primary ones we're gonna be talking about. And that is the dung beetles will increase soil porosity. And that involves both the aeration of the soil and the water infiltration into the soil. They can have a positive impact on nutrient cycling. So the dung beetles, the ones that we're primarily dealing with are tunnelers. They'll go into the dung on the surface and then tunnel down beneath it, taking the dung down into the surface of the soil to, to breed. That, as we've said, aerates and allows water infiltration, but it also gives this nutrient cycling. So the, the dung itself is incorporated into the soil profile and for every hole that's dug, the soil that was in that hole has come to the surface. So nutrients that were locked up beneath the surface of the soil, well below till, tillable area, is being, are being brought to the surface. Another major impact that these dung beetles have is they aid in parasite suppression. They can interrupt fly and nematode cycles, and I'll show you some graphics with regards to that. A graphic I won't show you is that they reduce runoff 
uh, polluting waterways. So if you can just picture a paddock with, what did I say, 29,000 tonnes across our region every day going onto it, then in a rain event, which we've been fortunate enough to have plenty of recently, uh, the potential is that that dung will be washed into creeks, into rivers, into dams, eventually finding its way into um, lakes and our water reservoirs, thus polluting problems associated with it. If we can be removing that dung from the surface, then we can be removing that potential for runoff polluting our waterways. What we'll have a look at here are some graphics uh, which depict the nutrient cycling and the soil porosity and the aeration uh, water infiltration that I'm trying to explain. So on the left hand side here, we've got a two day old cow dung and you can see the red soil that's been brought to the surface beside it. That's as a direct impact of dung beetles going down into that dung, digging the holes in which to take their dung down. And that's where the life cycle of many of the dung beetles progress. They lay an egg, it hatches into a larvae. The larvae eats the dung, which is below the surface, undergoes pupation and eventually emerges as the adult dung beetle, which we uh, uh, hopefully know and love. If I was to take a shovel, as I've done on the right-hand side photograph, you can see I've just scraped the dung off the surface. And I like this photograph because it shows you, you've got a, like a crumpet or a sponge-like effect of the surface of the soil. We once counted the holes there, but there's around about 40 to 50 tunnels which have been dug by the dung beetles directly under the area belonging to a, a cattle dung in this case. So the surface area of that cattle dung is now porous beneath it. What I'm about to show you is a video, and I'm just going to explain the video before we play it, and so it's a cue to the organiser, don't play my video just yet. This video is going to show you a cow pat, which is around about two days old. We know it's about two days old because of the strip grazing practices of the producer that led us onto their property where this video was shot. It's shot in the Riverina region, and it's remarkable. I think it's a remarkable little video very unprofessional, but shows the picture well. And it's showing you the dung beetle activity on a two day old cattle dung and how it's incorporated the dung into the soil and made it uh, water infiltratable and also very um, accessible to the air. So if we can play that video and I'll just let you watch it and uh, make your own judgment. You can turn the sound up on the video if you want. Remember, it's two days old. So we go back to this. So while I find that video remarkable for the capacity of the dung beetles to destroy a dung pat, in the Riverina region at the moment in winter, that was taken one month ago, this isn't unremarkable. Many of the pastures with the cattle and the sheep have that type of activity. So the dung is being incorporated into the soil with all of the positive benefits associated with it. So let's go to how they suppress uh, pest species. And we'll start with, with flies. I've used the uh, fly musca up the top here. The common Australian bush flies, musca vetustissima. Um, it presents a major problem both to our own enjoyment of uh, the environment, but also to the cattle and the sheep's enjoyment of their pasture environment. So how do dung beetles uh, help us in reducing or impacting the fly's life cycle? Well, I've shown you the fly's life cycle up here. It's going to be attracted to dung. It's going to lay an egg in the dung. That will hatch within around about 24 hours. And then we'll move on to the larval stages of that uh, fly. It will go through three instars before it pupates and emerges as a fly. If you look carefully at that screen there, you'll see that the larval stages, it varies between four to seven days. And this will be temperature and moisture dependent for the dung. So let's just take that seven day period 
of uh, larval growth before it goes into pupation. Anything that you can do to a dung pad, which is going to make it less environmentally friendly for that larvae, for the maggot to grow, will potentially disrupt the life cycle. Now you saw on the previous video that what we had was a dung pad within two days. So the fly's been attracted to it immediately after it's come out of the, out of the cow, one day for the egg, and then within a second day, that dung pat is largely disrupted and certainly within three or four days, there'd be very little left on the surface. So it's no longer an environment which is allowing flies to breed. So you can break the fly cycle in that regard. If you consider pink eye in cattle, then that's taking away uh, a vector which is going to be causing um, the, the, the problem. What we've got here is sheep dung, just to mix it up a bit. They operate perfectly well in sheep or cattle dung. And you can see in there the uh, sheep dung's being drilled into by the dung beetles. And the next photograph here, if you look carefully, you can see that what we've got there is a dung beetle tunnel. And then the finger is pointing to dung, which is actually being taken down into that tunnel by the beetles. So the surface is, is quite clean at this stage where we dug this up from. It was quite clean and dung had been taken directly down into the tunnels. And this in fact is, is sheep dung. If we move along, we can think about another pest, and that's the parasites. Um, we'll just consider the first of the three animals in that graphic. We won't worry about the horses. So the ruminants are a real problem for some of our nematodes, or the nematodes are a real problem for some of our ruminants. And again, in much the same way that we can interrupt the fly cycle with dung beetles, they can also interrupt the life cycle of nematodes. So again, if we picture the dung being freshly deposited, in this case, the eggs don't have to find their way to the dung. They're already in it, being ejected from the, uh, the sheep or the cattle, and then they'll hatch. Again, let's imagine a day or so to hatch. Going through several juvenile or larval stages, the first two stages, the L1 and the L2 stages, aren't infective, and they'll take around about seven days to get to there before it hits the third larval stage. And at that stage, the nematode is gonna crawl away from the dung, usually in a moist environment, maybe climb up some grass and then be currently uh, subsequently ingested by the, the sheep or the cattle and the life cycle is gonna progress again. So again, enter the dung beetles, anything that you can do to that dung pat to destroy the environment for the uh, nematodes before they reach that third larval stage and crawl away is going to suppress their activity. Thanks, John, I've got two minutes apparently. So these is gaps that we have in service issues. Dung produced doesn't always equal the uh, dung processed, and we recognize that that's seasonally variable. So that makes us ask what dung beetles we've got in our environment. We're going back to a map of Australia. You can find this on the dungbeetles.com.au website. And again, just as the MLA-based data that I showed you previously, it's broken down into the uh, natural resource management areas. Click on any one of those. Let's click on the Riverina and you'll see a list of the dung beetles in near you. So for all those listeners out there, after these seminars finished, go and have a look at what dung beetles are near you. And this is, resp we're responsible for the incorporation and inclusion of that data. So we're trying to map dung beetle density and abundance across Australia. So species density and uh, sheer abundance. We have the issue, this isn't gonna be animated on this screen. This is an animation, but it's obviously not gonna work here. So we have the issue with uh, seasonal variation uh, of dung beetles. They will be particularly abundant in the summer months and not so abundant in the winter months. Now, one of the aims of the Dung Beetle Ecosystem Engineers Project is to have abundance across the entire season. We're developing guides. So if we think about each of the NRM regions, this one is one we're developing for the Riverina. And in these guides, they'll take you through management strategies to encourage dung beetles on your property, show you the dung beetles that are on your property, and indeed show you the seasonal uh, variation of the dung beetles that are in your natural resource management area. So this is our most recent uh, graphic of the uh, dung beetles that will be present. I don't expect you to read it here. You'll be able to see it both on our website and in uh, publications from us quite soon. But what you'll see is that in spring, we don't have very many dung beetles. So you can see them increasing to a, a, dense, a population density that's desirable in summer and then decreasing 
So spring is a real problem. We're addressing that by the importation of new beetle species into the country. And we're also redistributing existing species that are in the country and established to other regions where they don't currently exist. So we're doing all of this through our monitoring and the redistribution program. I think we've got one more slide, and that is, of course, to acknowledge both the partners in this project that are listed on the screen in front of you, and most importantly, MLA and the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment, who have fund the Dung Beetle Ecosystem Engineers project. So at that, I'll leave it, and thank you all for listening. Uh, thank you very much, Russ. That was good timing. Um, we'll keep moving on to our next speaker, but in the meantime, I'm sure, Russ, you'll be around if people want to put questions on the chat for you. Our next speaker... Yeah, speaker absolutely. I'll, I'll be here. Good. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Belinda Hackney, who has over 20 years' experience in um, agronomy, particularly clovers, legumes, and it's their relationship with, with um, soil in my recent years. So I'll hand over to Belinda. Thank you. Thanks, Pilts. Um, all right. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I just wanted to, well, I was asked to talk about um, lessons from the drought with hard seeded legumes. So a lot of this will be compare and contrast how these legumes have gone in drought years compared to, um, you know, some of the some of the other years that we've seen. So um, we'll roll through this and, um, yeah, just sort of have a look at, at what we've seen happen with these things. So we're talking about some of the things around herbage and seed production across years with these in our replicated research sites, but also more interestingly, I think, and um, certainly more relevant for most people listening is how these things have performed uh, in grower sowings and, and particularly how they've come back or come through and come back following drought. And we'll look at some of the attributes that have contributed to their success in being able to do that. And also I'll throw in some things, there's more detail in the paper, um, but I've just picked out a few things to look at in terms of how these things fit into um, farming systems and some of the, the work that's been going on there. So I guess um, a big focus of the work that we've done over the last um, eight to 10 years has been around the establishment options that you have with hard seeded legumes, because the ability to harvest your own seed on farm brings summer sowing onto the table. And that was a technique developed in Western Australia where you use the unprocessed seed, um, basically that comes straight off the header, um, goes through a bit of gravity cleaning and that type of thing. But essentially it's an unprocessed seed. So it's unscarified or if it's cerebellar, it's in pod segments. So being able to utilize that means that you get your, your, um, your pasture sowing done quite early in the season, it doesn't compete with your winter sowing program. But to do that successfully, you have to have a good understanding of um, hard seed content, um, but then also um, uh, how quickly that, that hard seed breaks down. So that's been a big focus of the work that we do. Um, and you can see on the right of that um, slide that's up there at the moment, um, they're the little bags that we use for um, hard seed breakdown um, work. So hard seed at formation, so that's the seed, um, the proportion of seed that's hard in late spring or early summer when we go out to the seed collections. And you can see there with these hard seeded legumes that we're talking about, you're above 80% and in some cases above 90% with those. Compared to the subclovers, depending on cultivar there, it'll be somewhere between 70 and 90% hard seed with those. Now, if they're, um, we put them out in those little packs, uh, they're lightly covered with soil to simulate, you know, the sowing depth that you would put them in at. Um, and then we pull those up sequentially through summer and into autumn. And that's the kind of hard seed content that we've got. So what we're tending to find with things like arrow leaf, and bladder clover, gland clover, and the hard seeded French cerebellas is that usually around 50% of the seed is germinable by the time you get to mid autumn. Um, some of the things like bicerula um, uh, retain higher levels of hard seed, but then it's a much smaller seeded species than some of the others. So you're talking a million seeds per kilo, so if only 20% of it breaks down, that's still a lot of seed that's available for germination. And also some of the newer cerebellas, so Santorini, Albini, Sharano, those kind of cultivars retain quite high levels of hard seed. Now, with that, it just means that they can get up and away quite quickly. Um, and, and emerge and start to grow while temperature conditions are still um, 
you know, amenable to to getting high levels of growth. And there's a picture down the bottom there that just shows from a trial site last year, the the herbage yield from 0.1 of a square metre um, for a range of species that were sown in summer compared to subclover on the end, which is conventionally sown. Now, a common question people often uh, throw at us is, why don't you summer sow um, subclover? And two reasons for that. One is that you suction harvest subclover seed, and in that process, you get quite a lot of scarification of the seed. But the second thing also is subclover is quite susceptible to false breaks anyway, so seedling loss from false breaks. So if you sow it in summer and it comes up and you don't get follow-up rainfall, then you've got the potential to lose a lot of it anyway. So it's really just not a suitable species for that role in summer sowing. So anyway, that's the hard seed story. And there's that variation that you get in hard seed levels. Um, and generally what we find is that the further you go north, um, the quicker the hard seed breaks down. So going into central and going into you know, northern parts of New South Wales, you get higher rates of hard seed breakdown because it's not just the variation in temperature that causes the breakdown, but also variation in moisture. So higher summer rainfall, more moisture exposure. You've also got that temperature fluctuation and more of it breaks down. The further you move south, um, the less uh, softening you get. Um, in the eastern areas where we've been working, so sort of uh, you know, the 600 mil rainfall area, um, obviously you get more rapid hard seed breakdown than you do in some of the lower rainfall western areas. So in terms of what that means, um, if we look at the herbage production that we see uh, across years, across sites that we've had between 2012 and 2014, um, what you've got there is herbage production on the vertical axis uh, and then the different species, either summer sown or conventionally sown. So summer sown using unprocessed seed or conventionally sown using scarified seed in late May. Um, and what we can see there is say something like arrow leaf clover on average across all of those sites and all of those years, it's producing around about eight tonnes of dry matter when it's summer sown compared to about three and a half when it's conventionally sown. Now, the other species that we summer sow, they sit at around about four tonnes, um, and it's still significantly higher than what we're seeing when we conventionally sow them. And all of the summer sowings have been significantly higher than what we've seen with the conventional sowing of those traditional species. So that's averaged across all years. So what happens in a drought year? Um, we had three sites in 2019, uh, and at those sites, our growing season range for range from less than 75 millimetres um, to about 150 millimetres and sown into very dry conditions. And so what we can see with that is um, the arrow leaf clover came back from about eight tonnes to around about six tonnes um, on average across those three sites. And all of the other summer sown um, treatments uh, stayed at around about those four tonnes. So there was nice repeatability um, across years with that. And we can have a look at that comparison um, here where we've got on the vertical axis, the herbage production in a drought year as a percentage of all of those years that we looked at. Uh, and so what you can see there is that you're at 80% or above um, with the summer sowing uh, compared to the average of all years. So that gives you an indication that it's a pretty nice, robust um, method of establishing pasture and it's performed quite well um, despite the variation that we've seen in years. So if we go to seed yield, um, I suppose the thing to keep in mind with this, if you're thinking about um, the traditional species, the bare minimum that you want to aim for in terms of establishing a good, robust seed bank is somewhere between 120 and 150 kilos of seed produced per hectare. So if we have a look at summer sowing, um, average across all years with that, you can see that we're well above that with all of those species. So it's worked quite well um, as a mechanism for uh, producing a big seed bank. Uh, and also as conventional sowing, um, some of those there are above that level at or above those levels too, um, and certainly performed better than generally than what we've seen with um, the subs and the medics averaged across all of those years and all of those sites. If we go to what happened in the drought years, uh, and what you can see there is um, 
it's pulled it back in terms of what kind of seed yield that we've got. And there's there's less difference between the summer sow and conventional sow. And part of that is attributable to, um, you know, how much moisture actually has to go into supporting that herbage that's produced, um, all the higher levels of herbage that are produced under the summer sown treatment compared to the conventional sown treatment uh, in those drought years. But we're still generally at or above those minimum levels that that you want to have a reasonable um, seed bank. And certainly things like the arrow leaf are, are well and truly above that. So I'll skip a slide or two here in the interest of time. So if we think about some of the attributes that contribute um, to the capacity of these things to perform well um, across years, uh, this is rooting depth at one of our sites. Um, so just having a look at, at what's happening there with those. Um, and so you can see by Cerula and the yellow Cerudella are getting down to a depth of about 1.8 metres, which is pretty good for an annual plant. Um, French Cerudella at about 1.7 and the others at 1.3 to 1.4. So that capacity to get down deep into the profile, um, harvest moisture, even when it's marginal, um, is certainly contributing to their capacity for you know, pretty reliable herbage production um, across years uh, and also that capacity to form adequate um, seed banks. And these results that we're seeing both with the hard seeded legumes and the um, traditional legumes in terms of rooting depth uh, are very much the same as, as the information that's come out of the West um, in some of their earlier research in that you know, 1.6 to 1.8 metres for the Cerigellas and Vicerula and somewhere around 1.2 to 1.5 for the other species has been pretty typical and around 90 centimetres for subs and medics. So, um, yeah, that's just one of the, I guess, one of the advantages that you can have with these things is their capacity to access moisture and nutrients. Now, in terms of some of the um, other things that we've been looking at with these is uh, part of the current project that we've got is looking at the flow on benefits of these legumes uh, to cropping systems. So this is our site at Ungary in 2019. So the legumes were grown uh, in 2019 under pretty um, tough conditions there. Um, in 2020, just prior to sowing wheat, we went in and sampled um, to determine mineral nitrogen levels. So you can see there that there's a difference between those species. We had a continuous cereal treatment in there as a control. Um, so there's some differences there with those. Now, what we did when we sowed the wheat was we split the plots for nitrogen levels. Um, so we either had a, um, a, a nil treatment, um, nitrogen applied only at sowing or nitrogen applied at sowing plus um, a top dressing at growth stage 31 and then again at growth stage 51. So if we have a look at what that did uh, in terms of yield, um, and we can see there that if we look at the cereal and the subclover for a start with those, as we, now the blue is a nil treatment, I should say here, the orange is N only at sowing and the grey bar is N at sowing plus top dressed um, nitrogen at growth stage 31 and 51. So what we can see there with the cereal on cereal treatment and the cereal following sub treatment is that we've had incremental increases in grain yield. But what we can see with the hard seeded legumes is there hasn't been that type of response. So they've produced four tonnes of grain or more with nil nitrogen. Thanks, Pilts, three minutes on it. <laughs> um, so they've produced four tonnes of, of grain or more with nil nitrogen and we haven't been able to increase it beyond that. So that's pretty good news given that 2019 was such an ordinary year, um, their capacity to then go on and contribute um, sufficient nitrogen to support those pretty good yielding crops in 2020. Um, so I don't know, I just reckon that's a pretty nice graph, the reflection of the above ground results with the below ground ones. And I think I should stop my career in soil nitrogen and about there because um, yeah, I. I'm pretty happy with that graph. Now, if we look at grain protein, um, that follows a similar uh, kind of pattern in that we had responses in both the, the continuous crop and the subclover to addition of nitrogen, but not with the um, hard seeded legumes. So we're looking at generally with the hard seeded legumes, um, protein contents uh, 
beyond 12% with those. All right, now that's enough of replicated trials because uh, the more interesting part is what they're actually doing um, in pharma zones, I think. So this is just some examples of some of the um, some of the pharma zones that we've been involved with. Um, so the top two photos there are myco hairs. Um, on the left, there's a there's a site there that was sown in 2009 to buy ruler. Um, it's been through three rotations since its establishment, no further seed added to it, and that's regeneration in 2020 on those sites. And then on the right-hand side is a bladder gland arrow leaf mixture that was sown in 2014. Underneath that, um, Hungarian to limba, um, both sown to buy ruler, both in the middle of the drought, and that's regeneration last year. So um, pretty tough little plants. Uh, and if you have a look on these, we've just got the, um, the soil pH is listed and then what the biomass was at the end of winter and the peak biomass in spring. And in the paper, you'll find the herbage uh, quality of those there as well. So, you know, to recover from drought, no additional seed added. Um, some been through a rotation now um, heading for sort of uh, 11 years or so um, at the time of those photos being taken, um, pretty nice results with, with what um, people are doing with them. Some sites here at Parks, now they were sown in 2016 um, and that was a good year for seed production. But the interesting thing about um, these sites is all of them were used in 2016 as seed nurseries. Um, and the harvest index with the species that are sown there is somewhere between about 0.7 and greater than 0.9 if you're talking about gland clover. So um, not a lot of seed has gone back onto those in that big year of <coughs> 2016. Um, and then, you know, only small amounts of seed set um, in 2017 to 19. And this is regeneration on those sites last year. And this is, these are pretty hot soils. So acidic soils down around 4.7 and 20 to 30% aluminium um, at those sites. Uh, in that parks uh, area. Um, final one here, uh, a condoblin. This was a really interesting one, this fellow. Um, so I think it was eight different um, legumes in, in nursery blocks to have a look at, um, you know, what, what may suit his area. This was in 2017. Uh, 2019, really the only thing that was contributing any feed production for him in those um, areas was Viceroola. Early 2020, he, he sprayed it out um, and sowed wheat into it um, and then had a subsequent germination of Viceroola. So it was a really nice Viceroola oat mix. Um, it was 85 hectares, carried 440 heifers. Um, you can see on that, uh, you know, 163 kilos per hectare, minimum weight gain going on the on the minimum per head weight gain. Uh, if anyone can buy cattle for $3 a kilo at the moment, um, good on you. But even conservatively valuing at that, uh, you're looking at about $500 per hectare just on that one grazing. On the left, um, the photo there is immediately after grazing. And then on the right, that's five weeks later. Uh, and that paddock was destined to go for hay in spring last year. We'll miss that one since we're running out of time. So in terms of um, things that we've learned, I guess, from this is a lot of this comes down to if you're thinking of growing these legumes, it's this consideration of what you should grow compared to what you want to grow. So the seed nurseries really um, come into their own with this and, and pretty much all of the people whose paddocks we've shown you there have went through that type of process in terms of evaluating a range of species um, and growing them in small areas, treating them like a crop, uh, and then choosing which ones work better and, and looking at header harvesting those. So uh, as Sue said before, it's a bit of a case of bake your own cake. Um, and um, you know that's the option that you've got with these kind of things is, is options to bulk, um, bulk up. And once, you, once you're in that kind of situation where um, you have access to unprocessed seeds, and that's where summer sowing comes on the table. And if you do get to that situation and you're wanting to do that, there's a few little general rules, and I should have had those the other way around, but 
the first one really is summer sowing, while it's been really successful, it doesn't negate that requirement for a good cleanup phase. So you know, high seeding rates are a good thing to help compete with weeds, but it shouldn't be your only strategy to compete with weeds and trying to um, you know, clean up beforehand will just enhance the result that you get from that. But if you are in that situation and you get to there, these are the kind of minimum seeding rates that you want to look at. So if it's a cerradella situation, it's around 20 kilos of pod segments per hectare and 12 kilos of, of bare seed um, if it's a, you know, a bicerula or one of the clovers. And you don't want to forget about the um, delivery of rhizobia with those. So I guess the last thing is to the first year in with this, um, you know, regardless of whether it's a seed nursery or whether you're at the next stage and you're actually sowing more widely on your farm, the most critical thing is to, is to treat that first year like a crop because it's about seed bank setup. Uh, and that's um, that's really it for me. So the um, yeah, acknowledgements there, currently we've got an R&D for profit project and a whole bunch of partners, been a good project, coming to an end. That'll do me, Pilts. Thanks, Belinda, very much. Uh, again, we might keep going straight on to our next talk from John Francis, which is about crunching the numbers to stock or restock. And while you might be answering questions in the chat, John, I understand you and Bobby will answer questions at the end together. So uh, over Yes, to you. that's right, John. So John Francis, Director and Consultant at Vista. Thank you. Terrific. Thanks very much and thanks for the opportunity. Look, I'd like to start with a story and this story uh, usually, these stories usually involve my family and this one does too. Um, we holiday up the north coast and uh, typically we've got a leisurely start to the day and sometimes my wife will ask me to um, find a spot on the beach uh, prior to her coming down. And effectively what you're looking at there on the screen is what I go and do. Anyhow, I head off to the beach and get in the water. I usually come back out and all my stuff's gone. Um, so she comes down to the beach, um, sees that I'm in the water, picks up the stuff and basically um, moves to this. So on the left is my picture of absolute heaven. No one around me. My wife will pick up my stuff and she'll head over to the right, not just in the foreground. She'll find that cluster which is full of full of umbrellas there and she'll go and sit in the middle of that. Now, the reason I'm telling you that story is that it largely relates to personality types and psychology and the way we make decisions. And that's largely what my presentation today is going to focus on. So I wanna start with an exercise and I'd like you to think about the best and the worst decisions that you've made during a time of adversity. So on the screen, what you see is take a moment to think about the best decision. So think about the drought or bushfire or something. Did your best decision end up turning out well? Don't think about it too much, just a response, a quick response is a good response in this poll um, and that will be useful. And then after that, I've got a question there. Take a moment to think of the worst decision that you made during that period of adversity. Did your worst decision end up turning poorly, turning out poorly? And if you just submit your response there, um, essentially what we'll do is get up into some results. And the results are coming in now. And the majority of people um, who've answered that question so far have actually answered in a way where the good decision or the best decision that you've made has turned out um, very, very well. And the poor decisions or the, the worst decisions that you've made have turned out poorly. And whilst a few of you have gone against the trend there, this is not actually atypical. This is actually um, a, really, uh, a, a really a reflection of the way we look at decisions is effectively on the outcome rather than on the, um, on the actual decision itself. And I'll give you an example now. So if you think about the decision um, to go through a red light, uh, if we look at the decision quality associated that, you would typically associate that with a bad decision. And the reason for that is, you know, there's social convention and road rules that dictate that there's a high probability of that not going well. Um, but 
if you think about the outcome of that, it is possible that you can go through that process and come out unscathed. And so the outcome quality of that was, was good or right, but the decision quality was, was bad. And I think um, in droughts, we tend to do the same thing. And if I just, so we can have a bad decision, but still get a good outcome. And if I take that to the next extreme and just think about going through a green light, now, typically you'd say that decision quality is good on the basis that the weight of evidence is that you're unlikely to come to have an accident if that um, occurs. But in this case, the cars collided. So the outcome um, quality is bad or wrong. So the point I'm making is um, uh, when you look at this, you don't look at that outcome and say, well, I had a bad outcome on a green light. I'll never go through a green light again. Similarly, you don't say I've had a good outcome on a red light. I'm, I'll always go through a red light. And I think that's what we've got to reflect on when we're reviewing some of those drought decisions um, that we're going through at the moment. So Annie Duke's got a great book called How to Decide. And in Annie's book, she um, puts up this matrix uh, where she looks at decision quality, good or bad. Um, and she also looks at outcome quality, which is up the top. Now, in this case, you can have a good decision um, and a right outcome. And what you get from that is an earned reward. Or you can make a bad decision, still get the right outcome, so the red light situation, but that's more of a fluke. The weight of evidence suggests that it's unlikely to go with you. Similarly, on the, on the flip side of that, you can make a good decision, but get the wrong outcome. And that's just bad luck because you thought about it. It was a considered decision. You put the research into it, but it just went against you. Um, similarly, you can make a bad decision and get a wrong outcome. Well, Annie Duke suggests that you got what you deserved in that case. Um, and so there's the matrix. It's worth reflecting on that. And it's worth making sure that what you're doing is reviewing the decision quality, not the outcome quality, because they are two very different things. Um, so when you look at your review of um, drought or fire um, decision, recovery decisions, um, what, what actually happened was livestock values increased by about two and a half times. And I think what we've got is sort of two, um, two sort of people there. We've got the ones beating themselves up saying, oh no, I made a shocking decision because I sold my livestock in drought. And we've got the other ones beating their chest saying, I made a great decision because I fed in drought. But I think what's happening there is you're actually assessing the outcome, not assessing the decision. What I'm encouraging you to do is actually go back and think about the decision, not the outcome, because it's possible that those who sold in drought actually made a really good decision. And it's possible that those who fed in drought made a really good decision, or it's possible that you both flipped coins and said, I'm going to do that. Now I'm going to come up with option A or B. And I'm suggesting that's not a good framework for decision making. But the key point of this message of this slide really is to review your decision quality, not the decision outcome. And so you've got, when you're making decisions, you really got these two forms of uncertainty. You've got this imperfect information, which you've got some control over. And that's actually um, controllable between your beliefs and the decision. So you can control that imperfect imp information right up until the point you make the decision. But once you make that decision, between the decision and the outcome, that's actually down to luck. You have no, absolutely no influence on that from that point forward. So it's worth understanding how these how you come to these decisions and reviewing them to understand whether you actually improved the amount of information and whether you used the tools to make good decisions or whether it was just bad luck that resulted in the outcome that um, occurred. And so I guess the next point I really wanted to make was a little about um, understanding yourself, because there is a lot of psychology in some of the things that um, that uh, you're making decisions about. And with reference to um, trading and getting back in after drought or after bushfire, there's a couple of psychological issues that you need to consider. And the first is the ambiguity effect. And that is that um, typically what we do is avoid options that appear to be um, ambiguous or where there's missing information. And that occurs because we actually dislike 
um, uncertainty. And that means we'll go for a certain option um, over an uncertain option. But the problem with that is that certain option may not necessarily be either the best option or the most financially rewarding or um, result in those outcomes that are desirable for us. The second one is anchoring bias. Uh, bias. The number of times I've heard people say, ah, the cattle market, it's too dear to get in. Um, but what they're considering is it's too dear relative to where it was previously. But at the same time, um, steer prices and heifer prices and the, and the progeny prices have actually gone up at a considerable rate. So is it too too high to get in or is it actually that you're anchored against something that um, that occurred some time ago and you need to update your information and the final one is loss aversion now um, this is a, a pretty powerful concept because effectively what happens is that we actually value um, the pleasure from gain uh, it, it actually is considered half as powerful as um, the experience from loss so um, if you consider loss uh, basically relative to gain, you'll value um, a loss in a greater way than you will the value of gain. And typically what that means is that you can make skewed decisions. Being aware of these things is the key point and understanding that, that these can influence your decisions, but also that you have a chance of overcoming these with improving the information available to you. And so how do you improve that information? Well, there's all sorts of tools you can use. And one of those is, you know, thinking about pasture availability and so on. And this is just an example from um, where I've used past pastures from space data to look at pasture growth uh, in at Wagga Wagga from 2018, 19 and 20. Um, and so there's tools available. And the question is, did you do the sort of maths on the right hand side of this slide, which is really just working out that, you know, if, you're, if you've got half as much feed in your paddock or you expect to have half as much feed for the year as what you would normally have, then you're going to have a considerable feeding bill. But actually quantifying the extent to which that bill, um, what that bill is going to look like is useful in decision making because it starts to frame things up. The other tools are things like this. This is free from the Bureau of Meteorology. And what it's telling you is the percent ranks are in different colours there, um, with 100% being really wet and um, uh, in terms of soil moisture and the orange parts of that being really dry. And you can see from July to November in, that's 2018, the top one, 2019, both those periods were extremely dry soil moisture in the rooting depth um, in the root zone. That sort of gave me some indication that it's improbable that we're gonna have anywhere near average pasture growth. So using tools like that is useful. And this is just another one. This is uh, CSB P uh, Decipher Ag, all it's, it's an NDVI image and what it's telling, the intensity of those colours, purple's good, red's bad. Um, and I've just taken a point on the left-hand side of this slide, which is the drought, and on the right-hand side, which is 2020. Now, what this is telling me is that, you know, in August 2018, that there wasn't a lot of pasture growth. Now, you can do that by looking out the out in the paddock as well, but but coupled with that soil moisture sort of information, it starts to allow me to start to put some information together to improve my decision making. Um, the final point is um, you've actually got some really useful data. This is MLA data uh, around market information, and it's not just this stuff. There's also um, free market analyst information. There's, um, there's sort of updates from MLA regularly and that sort of thing. And that can sort of assist you in understanding the macro factors around decisions for trading and those sorts of things. Um, so the next point I really wanted to get into is, is there any value currently? And all I've done here is just taken a simple analysis, knowing that we fear loss more than we value gain. Um, the, the key point of this slide is just to when you conduct your analysis about getting in around trading is look at the downside. If you're really fearful of the downside, run some analyses around what happens if I get in at this, and this is sensitivity of return on investment to buying a cow, a PTIC cow at the moment at $2,500. Um, 
when yielding progeny falls from four dollars fifty to four oh five, three sixty, and three fifteen respectively, or and processor cow prices go from three twenty two eighty eight, two fifty six, and two twenty four respectively. And you can see what's happening is obviously the return on investment declines, but it's not going back to zero. So what that's saying to me is there is still value in the market and there is still some upside for you. Now, clearly, if the market drops by a significant amount, there's less to gain, but it's not zero and you're not losing everything. So just couching that fear of loss in um, next to the value of gain is really important. Okay. Um, so the, the final point I really wanted to make is with this slide, and really the key point here is that suboptimum feed utilisation um, actually provides certainty, but that certainty comes at a cost. And this is what's actually happened if you, so what I've got here is three columns, 350 PTIC cows, where I consider 500 would be optimum in this system. Um, and on the left-hand axis, what I've got is two-year cash flow, um, plus inventory value, because when you buy cows, you're actually buying some value in terms of assets as well. Now, I've got two tactical management strategies there on the right-hand side relative to being understocked, which is the left-hand column. And the two tactical management strategies were get in straight away, um, and the second one was uh, get in in year two. Um, so build up retaining numbers and then, and then go and buy the, the balance um, from that point forward. Um, what this is showing is that there was still a relative increase, even with prices increasing, but that's a bit of bias there. So what I did in the next slide is just said, right, I, well, if prices stayed at 2019 level, would, I, would there still be a relative increase from increasing feed utilisation? And the answer is yes, that's about a 15 or 20% gain in return, which is on the left-hand axis. So the key point is sub-optimised optimum feed utilisation um, provides you certainty, but that certainty comes at a cost, and that is the, the opportunity cost of um, the revenue generated and not based on a rising market, based on the 2019 values as well. So the key points that I really wanted to um, deliver in that very short time frame is it's really important that you assess the decision, not the outcome. It's important that you know yourself and your biases to improve your decision making. You, the aim is to reduce um, knowledge imperfection. Sure, we're coming from a position of not much information. We're trying to boost that a little bit. And the final point I'm making is certainty doesn't necessarily gain the high, give you the highest returns. Um, you may have to take an approach where you accept some level of uncertainty to generate some of those higher returns. Thanks very much for the opportunity to speak today. Thanks very much, John. That was good. Um, I think it's always good when someone challenges the way we think and the concept of assessing the decision and not the outcome, um, I think it's probably something, yeah, we all assess the outcome, I think. Our final speaker today, and as I said, I think both um, John and our second last speaker, Bobby Miller, will be around to answer questions at the end. Bobby is currently involved in a family operation running sheep and cattle at Jugiong in New South Wales, um, but has a background in commercial real estate and he's going to give us a talk about managing stocking during drought. Thank you very much, Bobby. Thank you, John. And uh, thank you, the other John, for that um, insightful talk. It, it certainly overlaps a lot with what I'm going to speak about in the next 15 minutes. Um, the subject here is uh, managing stocking rate during the drought, um, a subject which, new to the family business four years ago, I didn't really know much about. Um, and then coming out of the drought, have quite a bit of experience to draw from it. So I'm just going to share a few of these points which really factor into that good quality decision making before you launch into one of two strategies uh, to deal with the drought. Um, before I start, just to give you some background, our company is Coolac Cattle Company. Uh, we lease a farm called Kuanini, which is a family farm, 4,400 hectares uh, of grazing country at Coolac. And the stocking rate story over the last four years for our business was coming into the drought, we were sitting just over 47,000 DSEs of uh, self-replacing Angus cow herd and some 
um, dual purpose merino sheep. Coming out to the end of 2019 at the depths of the drought or the peak, whichever way you look at it, uh, we were sitting just above 27,000 EC. Uh, and, and that was really with a feed program, but it was, you know, the constraints of capital and resource just meant we had to scale down as the drought went on. Um, to today, and as we stand, we're at about uh, 46,000 DC. We just bought some more cows last week, actually, so that's tipped up a bit, aiming to be somewhere around uh, 50,000 DC going forward. So when uh, <coughs> when the rain stops and, and the feed um, stops growing, really, as a producer, we look at it through the basic gross margin analysis. And that involves looking at our current value of stock. Um, what's the projected feed costs? Is that going to be less than or more than the future value of the stock when the drought breaks, which will then infer to either feed through or sell it buy back? It's a great um, basic economic approach to it, which gives uh, an outcome depending on the information you put into that equation. Uh, what I'd like to cover off in this next little section, though, is all of the implied um, things to consider when you decide to either feed through and sell or buy back. Uh, there's simple things to say and the, the equation spits out a simple answer, but there's a lot involved in each of those strategies, particularly while you're battling a drought as well. So the considerations, apologies for the wordy slide. I'm a farmer, not a presenter, so I didn't um, have, have much resource to put together an interesting one. but. Things I'd like to cover off here, <clears throat> when you're approaching um, sort of a bulk feed program, so you're deciding to feed through as much stock as you can through a dry period, really that's becoming its own enterprise in itself, in addition to the uh, struggling grazing enterprise you're also managing on the drought. Um, most people here have probably seen a, a feedlot, a sheep or, or cattle feedlot. They're very intensive operations. Um, there's very good infrastructure on all fronts, machinery, um, uh, physical infrastructure, human infrastructure. It's, it's very well resourced because when you're feeding uh, livestock every day, it, it needs to be fail safe and it needs to have redundancy measures and it needs a team of professional people advising um, the program properly. And that in itself, in my opinion, is no different to when you launch into a feed program on your own farm. It's probably more so because us as grazers aren't naturally, uh, don't have a skill set in, in bulk feeding. A lot of it's new to us and, and each drought that comes around has a different set of circumstances and a different set of um, market dynamics at play. And so really for us to navigate that, in my opinion, you need to develop a, a, a network of professional support. And so for me, that was getting a nutritionist on board who understood stood all the different classes of livestock and their requirements. Uh, getting a vet on board, uh, Coolac Vet Services, we used Tom Graham, who basically wrote our health protocols for us. And, and initially that was reactionary as, as we encountered problems, but then as the years progressed, we became more preventative and, and we were sort of ahead of the game in terms of that. A consultant, uh, the previous speaker, John, is my consultant, and I don't really make any big decisions or many decisions at all anymore without checking with him or, or, or David Brown, our other consultant, first. Um, they're just too big and too consequential at the moment. The value of stocks since I've been home well, it currently has quadrupled. And so, you know, we're managing large resource bases and, and you really need... I thought that last slide of John's was fantastic where it shows the basic analysis of, of buying a cow at $2,500. Now, I don't think many farmers, certainly I didn't have the information to put that together and make it myself, but you know, a, a quick consult with a, a, a consultant who does this all the time can frame those big decisions when you're launching into a feed program. Um, a few other items there is that feeding isn't just a blanket, provide the same feed to all stock. Um, all different classes of stock need different feed and therefore different uh, resources to feed them. For example, cows and ewes in, in early lactation when they dry really only need a maintenance feed to maintain a certain condition score. Young stock really need a high quality feed to be on a lift rising plane of nutrition and, and growing. So a plan that is clear and concise and based on good information from outside uh, resources then feeds through into the 
resources you have, machinery, infrastructure, human, and then executing that plan is all going to cost a lot of money. And so a capital allocation and a capital plan where you have clear sunset dates or lines in the sand will feed into this point and then sell or will feed until this point, which uh, is winter and we usually have feed. W whatever it is, once you have that plan in place, you, you need to have the capital available to, to execute. There's nothing worse than, ex than embarking on a uh, feed program and having to pull out before the, the end of it uh, because of money. Quite often, it's the darkest just before the dawn. So as it's all looking terrible and we're in the middle of April and it hasn't broken and you're running out of money to feed, the worst possible time to sell young stock. Um, so, so capital <coughs> allocation and planning is very important. The main risk I, I see with this feed through strategy is that a poor execution of it does create more work, creates, certainly creates more cost and stress. And those three compounding can quickly erode the potential benefits that a feed program is supposed to provide. So avoiding those um, poor execution really comes down to planning, a good self-assessment, and then off you go. Um, just in reflection on thinking about this, this approach is probably most suited to uh, breeding operations, self-replacing breeding operations. A lot of the investment in those operations is in the genetics. That's hard to buy back into the same level with which you've invested. So feeding through, in, in, in our estimation, would be more suited to the self-replacing breeding operation. Um, looking at the option of selling and buying back, similar considerations, uh, obviously you're foregoing the feed component, uh, really backing yourself then to be able to buy in before, ideally, if not just on the break. And the main risk we see with this uh, approach is obviously when the break happens, and this is what happened in March uh, of, of 2020, is that it happened across the board. And a big break tightens up supply straight away. It increases the demand just as quickly. Prices take off and you're in a race with all other farmers to buy back in to uh, restock your farm. In this scenario, the cost of buying back into stock can quickly outweigh the foregone feed costs. So that's the main risk in consideration with um, this approach. I think it's also worth acknowledging that the trading and, and so, and that's what you're really going into if you take this approach is its skill set in its own and also requires a, a really good team of professional people to help you, agents, buyers, a consultant to run the numbers. And uh, when you're stepping back into the market, you really need a plan that outlines the parameters with which you want to buy in because buying into a production system is quite tricky, particularly when you have to buy back into numbers. So you often have to compromise on price or time of lambing or calving, or this one's got short wool, we're all long wool, but we'll shear it. Whatever the case may be, having a clear guideline before you start to step back in the market, and rather than just chase deals here or there, buy with a specific set of criteria is gonna help you get back into production sooner rather than later. Um, <clears throat> to that end, this approach obviously, as I said, mimics that of a trading system. So is more suited to producers who are trade heavy or indeed all trading, in which case this is what they would do. Um, working through, coming back to our business, um, as I said before, we, we set out mainly to feed through. My biggest fear in, in putting the decisions together was that if I sold out of say a thousand cows and then had to buy back in, um, as the price was taking off, that was too big a risk for me to take um, in terms of capital. Uh, and so in my view was I'd rather feed them through and roll the dice on the drought breaking sooner than sooner than later. Um, it didn't, but, but what did end up eventuating was the cow price did take off and, and it was cheaper for us to feed through. Uh, John, I know what you're gonna say, that that's looking at the decision based on the outcome, but um, I had to look in making a good decision at what the potential outcomes were. And that was one I wanted to avoid. So in that sense, it kind of was relevant to making a good decision. Um, we fed the steers for production. There was an inverse pricing at the time where the, the lighter the steer, the less the rate per kilo, the heavier they got, the more that rate went up. So even with a feed price of around 400 a ton, it still made sense to feed the steers. Um, we fed the heifers just to reach a critical mating weight. We wanted them to be at around 300 kilos by September for joining. 
We didn't quite get them all there, but that sort of dictated a different feed program for the heifers rather than the steers. Fed the cows to maintain a condition score, and I put in brackets there poorly because we certainly didn't keep them all at a condition score that kept them uh, productive. And most of our contraction in numbers came from cows not returning to estrus after their calving uh, in the window where we had bulls in. So we had <coughs> a big burn rate of cows coming back through the uh, over the over the years, which got us back to that sort of thousand cows in the middle of the drought. Um, again, I'm, I think in hindsight, it would have been better to feed those who keep them at three, and rather than sell them at reduced values in the drought and having to buy back a few post drought or or breed up, which is, has a lag. But you know, twenty twenty hindsight. Um, on. On the sheep, uh, we, we were sort of a trading operation coming into the drought where we would buy merino ewes, join them to a terminal sire, sell the wool off mum and a store lamb off mum. The problem came is that in, we were buying in and out in big numbers. And so when we had dry ewes, we would sell them, but then to gear up for production the following year, we would have to buy sheep in December to join in January to be in production for that winter. And it's again back to that point of buying and selling it was very hard to buy an article that fit into the program we already had we either had to compromise on wool length or time of lambing some were mules some were crutched and we ended up with a bit of a licorice all sorts mob of sheep uh, which then drove us into at the last year of the drought we shifted operation into a self-replacing composite ewe flock of uh, prime line genetics uh, the purpose of that was to be able to um, flex internally, if you will. So be able to scale up quickly when there's feed on and scale back while still maintaining an internal capacity to, to grow our numbers rather than having to step back into the market. Now that's a personal preference. Some people are perfectly happy to um, step back into the market and buy stock. I think at our scale, it, it was problematic. And so we solved that problem by, by bringing, making both of our herds self-replacing. Um, we also shifted in, in the restocking process a greater proportion of the production into sheep rather than cattle. And this mainly was to facilitate a quicker cash flow. Um, restocking with cattle is a lengthy process in nine months gestation and nine months before you can really sell a weaner and then another nine before it's a feeder. Uh, where a sheep, we were buying scanned lamb and we had a lamb ready to sell within six months. So. That was more based on, on capital constraints and, and neat cash flow needs rather than um, uh, rather than a preference in the first place. But but coming out of the drought, that's just what we had to do. Um, just a few photos here that, that speak to the, the infrastructure part, where where uh, really I can't recommend enough. If you're going to embark on a big feed program, don't save money on infrastructure. Uh, this the, the feeder on our left. It's not a bad mixer, but again, just fell short in a, in a few areas, had single axle and we've got hilly country, so it was rolling a bit unsafe. A few other things I won't um, bore you with, but anyway, after the first year, we traded it into a, uh, a new mixer, which cost more money, but I'm sure so ended up saving us a lot more in the long run with the numbers we were feeding. Um, next photo here, that's just the, the our feed setup we have. That's my little boy, Freddie, who was six months at the start of the drought and two and a half at the end. Um, this was a method for feeding weaners. We would give them a total mixed ration each day, um, which we found had problems. And so, again, without going into the detail on the short side, we, at the start of the final year of the drought, shifted our feeding system into this, which was going from a total mixed ration every day to feeding pellets and hay ad lib. So putting them in, in um, these feeders are called Roswell Ag feeders. There's 11 metres of trough space, six metre, six tonne capacity, big button. And we would give them ad lib access to pellets and hay, which we found with the weaners um, gave a much more uniform performance. They're all doing about 1.2 kilos a day and reduced our labour input significantly. So uh, speaking against the redundancy, we have two feeders and they can be pulled by anything so that if we have breakdowns, we can keep those animals fed. Uh, 
more infrastructure photos there. We had to upgrade our silos as we were shifting a lot of that feed into pellets from hay, but then some infrastructure there um, in our ability to feed hay out in the feedlots. Um, <clears throat> just one more thing to touch on, management measures. No matter which program you embark on, whether it's feeding through or buying and selling back, most of us will carry some level of stock through. Um, droughts greatly reduce the amount of feed, but there's still some to carry through. And so most of us carry it through. So these three management practices, I think, were the most effective at, at, at getting stock through with reduced feed. And the first is early weaning. It's, it's amazing what these livestock can do. We, at the end of uh, 19, uh, sorry, start of 19, were weaning calves down to 80 kilos off mum in November. So they were born in August. Uh, there was very little feed then. There was even less by summer. So we had a skinny mum with a little calf on it. We decided to pull them in, pull the calf off, um, fed the calf properly and, and picked mum up a little bit. And those calves caught up to the others, no problem. Fed properly and, and we gave them a fair bit of love, but they were all gone into feeder weights or joined as heifers the following year. Um, sheep, we, we weaned two weeks after marking. So basically put the sheep back in the paddocks, feed was short. Uh, once we saw the lambs are sort of happy and you know wounds had healed, uh, we pulled them back in and, and put mum out onto some lighter country and prioritised the little feed we, we did have left for the, for the young lambs to have them ready to sell as stores. Drafting on condition, uh, quite often when you, when you go and look at a mob and you see a, a tail, you think, okay, well, I need to bring these um, cattle in and, and feed them. There's often, every time we did this, we would draft into three categories. These ones need picking up. This section in the middle here, maintenance, and, and these ones are probably okay to go back in the paddock for a bit longer. Um, you know, particularly in a big drought, everything is tight. Feed's tight, money's tight, space is tight, and allocating feed to where it's most needed regularly and regularly reassessing that meant that we, we weren't feeding anything to anything that didn't need it. Um, it it's tight, and, and, and a few did get through the cracks, but with sheep and cattle, we were continually drafting on stock and how they were doing and feeding the ones it need most and letting the others ride it out a little bit longer. And the other measure there is scanning and preg testing, uh, just making sure that you're not carrying any animals through the drought that aren't producing you something. We would scan our uh, ewes on bang on 40 days after the ram came out, cattle bang on eight weeks after the bulls came out, and anything that was empty was gone. Uh, we didn't try and fatten them or do anything like that. There's enough going on to get your productive animals through, get the other ones out of the way. Um, in final summary, look, the correct approach differs for each farm. It, it, it comes down to your appetite for risk, whether you like feeding, in particular to your resource base, what you've got, what you're gonna have to buy to execute it, it properly. And an honest self-appraisal, I think, is the first step. So get someone in to help you, write out a plan, list out what you've got, what your contingency measures are, and, and really be, I can't emphasize enough how detailed you have to be to do that properly. Because when the pressure's on and you're feeding a lot of numbers, things happen quickly and you need to make decisions quickly. And then once you've got that together, come to a view and a plan based on your appraisal, stick to it. Indecision is worse than a bad decision, which again comes back to uh, John's thing. But, I really think that the outcome of droughts isn't in your uh, control. What, what is is how well you execute what you've decided to do. And sitting on the fence and waiting for things to, to fall into the right order just doesn't seem to work in a drought. You need to make one plan, stick to it and get on with it. And the final point I'd like to make is that um, a consultant once told me that the biggest cost of any drought is the lost production from being understocked in the years the following. And that's particularly true of grazing systems. So whatever your approach is, it needs to be made with the frame of reference of how can I get back to my optimal stocking rate as quickly as possible? Not breeding up over two or three years as was in John's previous slide, not waiting till it feels good and, and there's um, all the factors line up. They generally don't. Generally you need to get in and get going before it all comes to fruition and not lose any of those productions in the good years that follow a drought. Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening and uh, happy to answer any questions uh, with John afterwards. Thank you, Bobby. Um, do people have any burning questions or questions in the chat that they'd like answered now?
Um, otherwise, I, given the time, I'm happy to hand straight back to Sean McGrath um, after thanking all our speakers for this session. It's been fantastic. It's been quite a diverse mix of subjects. Um, so I don't know. Are people wanting to ask some questions or are they happy to move on to John? Uh, back to, John, to um, Sean. Sorry, John, there's one there um, which is quite a useful question, if I can just probably, sure. it, it's probably directed more so at Bobby um, than me, but it says, uh, what strategies are useful to accurately predict the, the future value of stock, of stock, particularly in drought scenario, uh, with unseen prices for stock in the current market? So the way I interpreted that is, um, you know, it, the future's unpredictable. I'm in a drought. Um, how do I actually uh, project that future value price and, um, and and what do I hang my hat on? And I think it's a really good question. I guess um, probably I shouldn't steal the thunder from you, Bobby. Should this be directed squarely at you? It's too um, difficult for me. Well, I think the answer is you can't accurately predict the future value of stock. What is for useful, though, I think is drawing a line in the sand where, where if you think it's going to go above this, then feed or sell. Or draw a line and, and come to a view and act on that view. It, it, it's impossible to accurately predict it. There's lots of graphs and historical data you can draw on, and I'd encourage people to um, engage a consultant or someone who's good at that, who has that information at hand. But I, I wouldn't be focused on trying to pick the exact right value. Um, try and pick a value that you are not happy to buy back in at and set that as your benchmark and operate from there back. Great advice. And and I guess the only point I was going to make is exactly the same one. Use whatever's at your fingertips. And some people took a view that, um, you know, cow numbers were very low and that it's going to rise more than it has in the preceding ones. You're entitled to that view. But whatever you do, hold a view and um, let that be the framework for your decision making. Wonderful. All right. Well, if we don't have uh, any more there, we might uh, wrap up just given that we've uh, we've gone a bit over time. So thanks very much, John and Bobby and John. Uh, I think using that uh, producer insight was fantastic. I'd like to also take the opportunity to thank all of our other um, speakers today. It was great role, uh, great uh, coverage over a lot of topics that we've had. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us today for the 2021 Graham Centre Livestock Forum. Uh, we do have a short survey uh, that we would like to uh, get you to complete, please, uh, before you sign off today. So that survey will actually come up as you go to leave. So there's only a handful of questions and your feedback is important to us. Uh, so please take a few min minutes to complete that. Uh, I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsors again, Local Land Services Riverina, Meat and Livestock Australia, Nutrient Ag Solu Solutions, Sheep Connect New South Wales, Animal Health Australia, ProWay Livestock Equipment, NTs. Thanks also to the other members of the forum organising committee. Uh, we start this process quite early in the year to get everything together. So thanks Emily Malone, Michael Campbell, John Piltz, Jeff Casburn, Fru Adolhai, Dion Howard, Emily Stearman and Martin Pruce. Also uh, to Tony Nugent for editing the proceedings and Adam and Sasha at Pyrus for the technical support for the conference. So thanks again for joining us today, and we look forward uh, to seeing you again at future events.